I was thinking to myself, there are, there's going to be a lot of adjustment that has to be made. And uh, when the two of them from a very different background come together, they are my nephew, my cousin's child, uh, the child and the, the wife. They come from very different background. You know? So there are a lot of adjustment to be made. Uh, they have to face the in-laws. They have to relate to all the relatives. Uh, they have to they have to think about how to bring up the children, you know, and uh, and besides that, they have to think about the new change of everything, the, the home they're going to, the new estate, new neighbours, and when two of them come together, staying together, uh, they have to deal with each other's uh, idiosyncrasies and living habits from house, how they do household chores or to how they they're sleeping patterns and habits, to spending ha uh, patterns and habits. Uh, there will be a lot of clashes, a lot, a lot of clashes. If you don't believe, you can ask uh, Trifina and Sidong. I'm just kidding, they are, they are good, they are good, they are good couple. No, they are, <laughs> okay, you can ask any married couple, any married couple. So, um, so what will they be facing? Next, please. So I put here, they will be facing this thing called value clashes. What... Uh, the man see as important may not be what the wife see as important. So in all relationships, there will be this thing called value clashes. And also, they must understand that the vow or the covenant they are going to make is not just for ceremonial formalities. There is going to be a lot, a lot of drastic, very drastic change in their lives and their relationship. You know, and this is what is happening now at Israel. For the passage of bread, and they go, there's going to be a drastic change, and that's what we're going to talk about today in this passage. But before we go on, we're going to take a look at uh, last week what we have uh, discussed. What we have discussed, yeah. Okay, uh, next please. <laughs> okay, uh, just recap chapter four, and uh, well, what we are discuss is Moses began last week talking about uh, giving them three things. A warning to tell them that you're going to fail, you're going to fall before God. So there was a warning against com the complacent and the idolatrous heart of the Israelites. You know, the heart will be complacent and they need to recognize that the heart are idol idolatrous. You know, this is, so it seems that before giving the Ten Commandments, idolatry was already spelled out. You know, it is like the base of all sins. The idolatry is at the root of all yeah. things. And then they also challenge them, therefore, to come back and seek God. No other God. No other heaven and other. No other true God in heaven and earth, rather than, uh, other than God, the creator himself. Lastly, he reminded them of God's gracious And this is in the three cities of refuge that they will, and this is they have committed unintentionally. Yeah. So this is what we covered last week. So let's pray as we're going to dive into today's passage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us your precious word. Uh, we pray, God, that you open our eyes to see this wondrous truth from your word. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will help us, help us to not just understand this truth, but to bring this truth deep down into our hearts. We and we may, may we see hope and your grace through your word as well. Be with us, God. Grant us energy that we need, not just us, but also the CF uh, people who have gathered. We pray that God, your Holy Spirit, will work wondrous things in our hearts and in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. First. I put here a verse again by Moses describing and repeating to the second generation uh, Israelites that God has saved them from Egypt, brought them out and defeated the two kings that were against them, the Sihon and the Ok. And then now they, are, they possess this land of Bashan and Hezbon. You know, and God, uh, and so in the verse part, it, we talk about how God is bringing them the law. And chapter 5, verse 6 says again, you know, this is what God did for you. He brought you out of Egypt from a land of slavery. And this is an important uh, repetition for them to remind them again. And if you take note with me, verse 44 and chapter 5, verse 1, he keeps saying that this is the law, the testimony, the statutes, <coughs> excuse me, 
and the rules that God has given to you. you know? And then, chapter 5, verse 2, they changed the word. So, the, he no longer used the word law, but he changed and he used this word called covenant. You know, and he used twice. Next, please. What is covenant? Covenant is a special word for relationship. It is an agreement or it is a promise or a vow. And it's um, normally at that time probably made between two good friends or two kings or two business partners or even husband and wife in a marriage. And over here, if you take a look at it, say it is a special thing, it's a privilege that's given to them and not to their forefathers. Can you see? It's a privilege given to them. So now God is going to establish this covenant or a special relationship with the Israelites. It's called a covenant. You know, and this is going to be a drastic change because the holy God and the righteous God is going to establish relationship with sinners like you and me. I mean, like Israel, the Israelites, represented by the Israelites. You know, and I see a normal covenant are two parties of an equal standing come together, right? A, a businessman and a businessman, they shake their hand. There are two equal, part, two equal parties. Or a king and another king. Or husband and wife. It's a two equal party. But now, this covenant is different. It's a holy and righteous God who cannot stand sin, now extending His hand and shaking His hand with sinners to make and establish this covenantal relationship with men. This and this is as done in a very special way. Take note, take note of the sequence over here in this passage. It begins by saying that how God saved them from Egypt, from slavery, brought them here, then He gave them the law. It is not the, the other way around. It is not that at the Egypt, God gave them the law and says, guys, these are the rules. One, two, three, four, five, and two, ten. Do them. If you pass, I will save you. If not, you can remain in slavery. If God does that, they will never come out of uh, slavery. You get me? Because they will never meet God's standard. So how does God establish that covenant now? God bring them out first by His grace. He deliver them from, deliver them from slavery. And after delivering them, then He gives them the covenant and establish that relationship with them. Can you see it's the opposite direction? So I put here, covenant is this. It's God graciously rescue His people from slavery so that He can establish a harmonious relationship with Him. I repeat again, God graciously rescue them first. Rescue them out from slavery first. Then give them the law. Then establish that relationship with them. This is God's gracious working. The way He work out His covenant with sinners. It's very different. It's unconditional. You know? And so, what do we see from, what do we learn from here? So, you need to step back and see that whatever physically happened to Israel is a showcase of what God would do spiritually to the whole world. I'm going to show you a diagram. Oh yeah, that's a diagram. It's a, it's a, Israel is a showcase. You can see, Israel was saved physically from slavery in the land of Egypt. And how did God do that? God saved them and bring them out through this physical law that, he has, to, that has to be uh, accomplished, which is by war and signs and wonder. You know? But then, there's a spiritual thing that's happening here. It showcases that what, this is what God is going to do to sinners. And God is going to save sinners out of slavery, not to Egypt, but slavery to sin, our self-centeredness, our idolatrous heart, and Satan, the root of Satan. He's going to save us from slavery for sin and Satan. But there is a physical law, that, uh, there's a, as much as there's a physical law to save a nation out of another nation, which is by war, there is also a spiritual law that God has to follow to save sin out. And the spiritual law is this, that the debts of the sin must be paid for. You must pay the debts and you can rescue them out. You know? And what is the debt of our sin? Well, the debt of our sin, the punishment for our sin is death. 
dying, eternal separation, facing the wrath of God. That is a spiritual law that God has to meet in order to save sinners out of slavery in sin and idolatries and Satan. And God did that. Next, Romans chapter 3 tells us this, for we all have sinned, all of us, and totally fall short of the glory that we ought to reflect God. We are no longer living like a true human being, which is the image of God, it's full of glory, and no longer happens because of our sin. And God justified us. Can you see? He justified us. He made us right to Him. He, he, he's established that harmonious relationship with us. And He, he made the covenant with us by His grace. That's what He did for Egypt, from, for, from Israel, from Egypt. You know, that's what He did by His grace. True redemption, and that's the word used for saving or paying someone, bringing someone out of slavery through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus fulfilled that spiritual law. Can you see the word that by, as a propitiation by his blood? It is, really means that he sacrificed or he offered up his life to die and to pay for our debt. And this is to be received by faith. And this is how God shows His righteousness. This is how God fulfills that spiritual law for us. Can you see, in order to save us from sin, out of sin, out of slavery. So God graciously provided Jesus to fulfill that spiritual law and to establish that covenant with sinners. You know, like all what we said, what we talked about at the beginning of the uh, this sermon, they say all relationships come with value clashes. A husband and wife come together, a newlywed come together, they will find that a, there will be a lot, a lot of value clashes. Business partner comes together, uh, kings come together, talk some, on some agreement, there will be value clashes. Next. And so these value clashes is very true when God, the Holy God, established that relationship with sinners. Make that covenant with sinners. There will be a lot of value clashes. A lot. But the difference is this. A normal human value clashes most likely uh, a party of two imperfect uh, person coming together. The husband uh, is imperfect. The wife is imperfect. They come together, there will be uh, value clashes. And both probably need to change. Both also need to repent. But in this case, it's different. God is holy and perfect. There is nothing for Him to change. What needs to be changed are sinners who are imperfect. But we are not just imperfect, you must understand. Our value systems are actually opposing God. Our value system and our idolatrous heart is actually rebellious against God Himself and is totally detestable to Him. So God needs to help us to live that righteous life. He, after establishing that relationship with us, He needs to help us to live that righteous life. Let me give you an illustration. It's just like a king going out of his palace and he sees on the, on the street a beggar boy. You know, and he took pity on him and he adopted that beggar into his palace to become his prince. You know, and Therefore, he established a new relationship with him, a covenant relationship with him. You know. But the beggar who had been living out in the streets for years, come into the royal family with all the bad habits and bad attitudes. You know. So he would bring along with him all these things. He would steal food in the palace. He would not bathe. He would be rude and rough with his mannerism and all this. So the king needed to help this beggar, which is now his prince, you know, to behave like a prince. So he needs to give him rules, regulations, educations and all. So there will be a drastic change, a very drastic change when the perfect God adopts you and me to be his children. You know, so what we need to do next, I put here as we need to live by the rules. We need to live by the rules. And now, verse 7 to verse 21 is a most exciting passage. It's commonly known as the Ten Commandments. You know, and it's very hard to preach through these Ten Commandments because it is a very compact summary. 
of all the laws of God. You know, and it is so rich in content, it actually requires us to take 10 weeks to preach through these 10 commandments. Trust me. We, take, we, we took about 12 weeks, I think, to introduce 10 commandments, go through 10 commandments, summarize the 10 commandments. We took about 12 weeks to cover these 10 commandments. You know, so it's difficult. And so what we're going to attempt here is only very brief and on the surface. Okay, so I'm going to cover five broad things that we need to know about these Ten Commandments. Okay, first, the, these Ten Commandments, these laws reflect God's at, attributes, which is Him being holy, and there's no other gods in heaven and on earth except Him as a creator. And it also reflects His character, that this God, uh, what reflects Him is justice, and mercy, and this matters to him, to his heart, Lord. Justice and mercy, love and righteousness, holiness and graciousness. This matters to his heart, a Lord. So this law actually reflects him, reflects his attributes and his character. So it's only right for any human being made in the image of God to live in this way. More so, the Israelites, now they are even saved, established relationship with God to live like a true human being, reflecting who this God they are supposed to reflect as the image of God. Take it in. Okay. First point. Second point. This, this Ten Commandments is split into two portions. The first, commandment, first four commandments deal with a vertical relationship with God. It's about loving God. The next six commandments or so, six, huh? it deals with our horizontal relationship with one another. It's about loving our fellow men made in the image of God. So it has two components to it. The first four to God. The next six is about loving men. It's about loving God and loving men. Each of these commandments, of these camp commandments, has a spiritual principle behind them. You must understand that these commandments were written like 3,500 years ago. It's a very long time ago. So some people really say, ah yeah, these commandments are all outdated already. You know, but some people are a bit more scared. They say, no lah, maybe some of them are outdated. Some of them are not outdated. So they you know, begin to choose some yes, some in and some out. So maybe Sabbath are yeah, not very useful, so they, they pick up Sabbath. You know? So there are people who actually do that. You know? But if you remember the first two points, that number one, it reflects God, then none of these commandments ought to be outdated, or to, ought to be treated as outdated. Moreover, in chapter 4, or if you remember at the beginning of chapter 4, there was already a warning that you don't add things to the Lord of God, neither should you take things away from the Lord of God. So if we begin to say that these are not important, this one can kick out, you are actually taking out the laws of God. You know, there was already a warning in chapter 4. Remember that? Chapter 4, verse 2 to 3? Something? Yeah. So, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the spiritual principle behind each of these laws? Okay. Hold on to your seat. Ten commandments we're going to go through. What are the ten principles behind these ten laws? Law number one. You shall have no other gods before me. What is this about? Next. I put that the principle behind should be next. Yeah. Worshipping this God and loving this right God. There are many gods offered to them in Egypt. The moon God, the sun God, the Nile God, the uh, uh, whatever, the, all the animals, the crocodiles, whatever. They have, they have many birds and all this. They have many, many animals, uh, all, things, um, all made in the uh, image of uh, 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 all the created things here on earth. You know, so yeah, the offer with many, many different gods for them to choose from. You know, so, but idolatry, to worship these created things in this created realm is really an insult to this God who created all things, to the creator himself, to the true God of heaven and earth. 
That's why the first commandment is worshipping and loving the right God. The second commandment says you should not make any images of this God. You shouldn't represent Him by anything here on earth, no matter how great that is. Even if it's made of gold, like the golden calf, you know, made of pure gold, it is not good enough to represent this unseen and more superior God. So the second commandment is this, is to worshipping and loving God the right way. You don't choose your own way to approach God and you don't think that, oh, I'm going to represent Him in this way. I'm, I'm, as long as I'm sincere, I can approach God this way. No. You approach God, God's way. You have to approach the right God, the right way. Is there anyone, oh, it's okay lah, all trees, like the roots, are there, all, all the roots all leads to, to the trunk, and finally the trunks to the, to the sky, it's like all roots leads to, all, all roots leads to Rome. No. You worship God, the right God, the right way. Next. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What is in the name? Well, the name of God really represents who God is, His attributes, His character, and Him, who He is. And there are three, being God Himself, He used three ways to introduce Himself to us. What are the three ways? He used creation. Psalms 19 verse 1 says, when I, when I look at the creation, behold, you know, you behold the creation, the psalmist says, well, I see the glory of God and the name of God in the creation, right? the beauty of God in the creation. And also, he used the creation to introduce himself to us. Second, he used his word to introduce himself to us, the word of God. And lastly, the climax of his introduction is the living word of God. The climax of his introduction is in Jesus himself. So, God introduces himself to us in these three ways so that we may get to know him. And the, what we do is when we misuse these things, we are actually taking him with, treating him with no respect at all. So for example, if you go to a museum and you see an artist and you see the painting there, you know, and you see the hours of work, the creativity, the efforts, the concept of artists or inside here, the imagination of artists, the personality of artists are all inside this art piece. Uh, art, art piece. What you do is walk in the museum, you take art piece, ah, nothing, you just throw on the floor, you step away. Or you make some careless, insulting remarks about this piece of uh, artwork. It's an insult to the artist himself. So in the same way, God reveals his glory to us in the creation and we are blind to his creation. And we, are, in fact, we even abuse this creation. We are blind to the creator behind the creation. Second, the word of God God reveals himself through his word. And when we look at the word of God, we say, ah, oh, yeah, well, this one very boring, huh? Yeah, well, the word of God very boring. We take it very lightly. You know, we are also actually misusing the name of God. Lastly, God sent his son to reveal himself to us. That's what Jesus told Philip. Is it? Jesus told Philip, when you see me, you see the Father. You know, and... That's what it is. But when people don't pay attention to who this Jesus is, they are also misusing the name of God. You know, so there are different ways that God introduced him, Himself to us. We treat it lightly, careless attitude towards it. So I put that the principle behind this is worshipping and loving God with the right attitude. Not frivolous, not callous, not put up. Okay? So it's treating this God with the highest respect. Third, keep the Sabbath is really loving God, worshipping God, next, and yeah, worshipping God and loving God with the right priority. Six days you may work, the Lord says, but the, the rest day signifies the kind of priority they need to give to God. Now we recognize this in Exodus 20, when the Ten Commandments was explained about this, the fourth, com fourth law, it was explained from a creation perspective. It was like telling them, you don't so, so much immerse in the creation, you forget that the creation is made for the Creator. Your priority is lost. Over here, you will see that it was argued from the perspective of deliverance or the, uh, uh, delivering them from slavery. You know, so 
yeah, now that you are free, you can do anything, your workers can do anything, but when you go into the land, you don't focus on working and working and earning all the money, gathering all the fruits, rearing all the animals, that you forget about God. So your priority cannot be lost in both ways, either creation or redemption perspective, is that your priority about God cannot be lost. So worshipping and loving God with the right priorities. Uh, recently in our IDG, weekday IDG, we were quite encouraged when some, someone shared with us about uh, one of our teenagers in our church who works now before her poly starts and was sharing with us that how this lady decided not to work on Saturday and Sunday, although the pay was much higher, you know, where you work on weekends. But she chose not to work on these weekends because she wants to attend the youth IDG on Saturday and she wants to come to church on Sunday. You know, I think this is one example of how a person puts a right priority about God and not forget about Him, focus on this creation, forget about Creator. You know. okay, next, so these are the first. The next three, uh, next six, about human being, about our vertical, uh, horizontal relationship. Honoring your parents, I think the, the principle behind really is loving men, by respecting our first human authority. And it is so important that this commandment comes even before murder. You know, and uh, God put this priority on us honoring our, our parents. Next, murder. This principle is really loving men by respecting life and not hating people, not despising people, not looking down on people. You know, and murder. Next. Is loving men by respecting sexuality and sex. That's, we shall not commit adultery about. We have no liberty. We are not in any liberty to redefine our sexuality. You can say, I'm born as a guy, but I feel like a woman inside, I think I will change. No. God made us who we are. You know, so we are not in a liberty to define, redefine our sexuality, nor our sexual relationship. Sexual relation or sex is only permissible within the marriage covenant. Anything outside or added to it, it is sin. So we are not in the liberty to redefine sex as well. So this is uh, the principle behind the next three. Yeah. You shall not steal really to love men by respecting respecting their God-given gifts. This is their gifts, their possessions, their properties that God has given to them. You have no right to say, well, I think I deserve some. Then you take, you know, it's God's given. If they are rich and you are poor, it has nothing to do with you. This is God's prerogative to give them. Next. Thou shalt, you shall not bear false witness, really, to love men by respecting truth and their reputation and not to mar their reputation, gossip about them, uh, uh, slander them and all. Okay, next, you, you shall not covet. It is really to love men by being contented with God first and not to be jealous about other people. And this is a very complex commandment in itself because this targets at the heart. There's no part particular actions given here. It is just the heart because you could be just standing at the corner of the hall here looking across the other side of the hall, he says, yeah, I just wish I can play like Carissa in the piano. Wow, she plays so well. I just wish I play better than her. I mean, not only better, like just play as well as her. It's just in the wishing of the heart and you did not do anything. You know, just it's coveting. It's coveting. You know, I, you're, you're, some of you are sitting there, you know, uh, Ray sitting there and think, wow, I just hope I can be as handsome as Uncle Chiong. No, at the corner there. <laughs> I know he didn't think so. No, okay, he didn't. Okay, so yeah. I mean, this is coveting. He didn't do anything. He didn't go and do a plastic surgery. He didn't. He just wished. And that's why this commandment, the tenth one, is very complex. It's, 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 it's not even seen in an action, you know. So, so it is really to be contented with God. It's a summary of all the ten, and also to be rejoicing for other people who are better than us, you know, not to be jealous of them. So the third thing about these Ten Commandments is each one of them comes with a principle. Okay, next. Fourth thing about these Ten Commandments is this. Is to, loving man is so closely linked to loving God. The last six 
and the first four are so closely linked that if you break any of the last six about your horizontal relationship, you actually break the first four. The vertical relationship we've got. You say, how can you say that? Next. 1 John chapter 4 says this. If you, anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, number one. Number two, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. He cannot, cannot. It's an impossibility. It's not he shall not, he may not. No, it's cannot. It's an impossibility. It's a case of impossibility. He cannot love God whom he cannot see. So I want implication for this understanding of this, this, this uh, uh, principle of the Ten Commandments. Is you cannot love God when you cannot love people. You cannot. You simply cannot. It's an impossibility. What is a liar? What will a liar say? A liar say, I love God. But it's the church, huh? the people in the church. Huh? Like Derek, uh, oh, I cannot stand him. No. People like Derek, oh, you look at him. Hey, I cannot stand him. Uh, people say this kind of thing. It's a liar. Can you see? It's a liar. The person says, I, I, I love God, but I just cannot stand church people. He's a liar. He, re- he doesn't love God. He loves himself. Second, people can say, I ah, well, just did a little bit of gossip about other people, or I, I, I just withhold my forgiveness. I just refuse to forgive this person. But I still love God. He's a liar. He's a liar. Can you see that? Because we have just read, if you cannot love people, you cannot love God. You actually hate God. You hate God. No F. You hate God. Okay, the fifth one. Last one. Fifth things to understand about this Ten Commandments is that when you break one of them, you break all of them. You break one commandment, you break all the commandments because it's the same God who gives this commandment and you break that, you are offending the same God when you keep the rest. You see the same God that you are breaking. You know. Next, James chapter 2, verse 10, 11 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point, has become guilty of all of it, all of it. For he says, it's the same God who says, do not commit adultery, also says, do not murder. But if we do, do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Can you see that? You break one, you break all. Implication. You can't take any single law lightly. You cannot. You cannot think that, okay, this one more important than the other one. First one more important than the ninth. The ten is more important than the fourth. No, you cannot. So, assumption would be, I can still worship God when I still can enjoy a bit of idolatry, a bit of sexual sin. I can still worship God. You cannot. You are breaking the whole law. Next. The other assumption is that I can tell a bit of lie. Just a little bit, lah, huh? a little bit. But at least I didn't murder one. No murder worse, right? But a bit of lie, lah, a bit of lie. It's okay. Cannot. You're breaking the whole law. You simply cannot. Can you see that? Yeah. So, I'm going to conclude here. I don't know about you. If you are sitting here and listening to all the laws and explanation of the law, and you are feeling a bit uncomfortable. In fact, more than a bit. You are normal. You are normal, and it may be a good thing if you feel guilty, if you feel shameful, maybe even fearful. It's actually a good thing. It could be God using His law, speaking to your heart graciously. And to be honest, these laws are also written in our hearts, our conscience. We break some of these laws, we know. Even you don't know God, you know lying is wrong. You know. You know committing adultery is wrong. You don't have to know Jesus to know that. You don't have to read the Bible to know that committing adultery is wrong. It is written in our hearts because we are made in the image of God. So these laws are actually written here. It's just that this law spelled it out very clearly for us. Can you see that? So you may feel uncomfortable because you are made in the image of God. You may feel guilty, shameful, 
fearful, which is good for you. God could be speaking to you. But if you are sitting here on the other hand and you are feeling nothing, no guilt, no shame, no fear, you may be in grave danger. So, if you are listening to this and you know that you are guilty as charged and you will one day be answerable and I will be answerable too during the judgment day when this law will be fresh out again and our lives will be measured against it. But having said that, this law, the way this passage is arranged also give us hope. I put here, a hope that we can that we may feel you are you're feeling guilty, shameful, and fearful. But through a matter is through looking at this passage, you may also have you can also feel hopeful. Remember the sequence here that we, we talked about earlier? God saved Israelite out first. Then he gave them the law. That's what God is going to do. You know. God first rescued the Israelite from slavery. In the same way, God is going to rescue us. And God has rescued many of us as Christians and adopt us as His children through the giving of His Son. And now that He has saved us as His sons and daughters, He wants to teach us to be good sons and daughters like His true Son, Jesus Himself. We are beggars, now prince, now we need to learn to be like the crown prince, Jesus Himself. And that's why the law is given to us. You know, this is the hope that we have. So I'm going to show you one verse. Jesus who have no sin to become sin for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, For Christ suffered once for sin. The righteous, he is the righteous. He is, not, he is the one who did not break any of God's law. For the unrighteous, which is us. So that should bring us back to God. This is the hope that we have. You know, he did not break law, but he paid for all of us who breaks all who break all of God's law, all of them, we pay for our failure. You know? So, there are two things to this. Number one, next. If you are not a Christian, you can find hope of forgiveness in Jesus. In this Jesus, the righteous God, the Son of God, who came and paid for our sin. You can find hope in Him and you can believe in Him. Second, if you are a Christian, you need not be despair. Although you may be trying and you feel guilty, you have failed. You need not be despair too because what we need to constantly do is to turn our eyes to Christ, our righteousness. Don't turn to your own righteousness. If you turn to your own righteousness, you will either go too extreme. You'll be so proud because you don't see your sin clearly. You'll be so proud. Or you see your sin so clearly, you'll be dropped into despair. But don't turn your eyes on yourself. Look at Christ, our righteousness, and know that He has already loved you. And now go and obey these Ten Commandments to live like the real prince and princess, princesses of Jesus, of God. Summary. So God rescued His people from slavery and gave them the Ten Rules to help them to live this new covenant relationship with Him. This is what God has done for us. Praise be to God. And a reflection for us is how well do you think you are living by God's rule? Whether you are Christian, who knows the word of God, how well are you living by God's rule? Or not a Christian who knows some of this law actually in your conscience. Yeah. I hope you will find that hope in our Lord Jesus himself. Let's close in our closing songs. Let's all stand.